Hey everybody, and welcome to this, my second of two videos on the Nikon FG20. In the first video, we looked at what all of the buttons were, and in this video, we're gonna look at what all of them do. First thing we're gonna do, though, is we're going to put batteries in this camera because you need batteries to do basically anything. You can use the manual shutter speed without batteries and the aperture will stop down, but the light meter and the electronic shutter speeds require batteries to work. So let's start there. This camera uses two batteries, the 357 SR70, S76, A76, LR44s. They're all the same type of battery. What you do is you just take a US nickel or something that's the same width and put it into and put it into the slot on the battery chamber and then just unscrew it to get into the battery housing. There you go, you can see the battery chamber. So this is the battery cap itself and it gives you a, an indicator of the type of batteries on it. It shows you that you need two 1.5 volts and there's a diagram that shows the orientation based on the, the profile of the batteries on how to load them. On this side, it gives you an alternate option, which is a single battery that's the size of two A76 or 357 batteries. I think they're still sold. I, I haven't seen one in a store in a really long time. So realistically, what you're looking at are two 1.5 volt batteries, not the one three volt battery. So the A76, 357, LR44 batteries, whatever you want to call them, go in this way. And you know you've loaded them correctly if you hold the battery adapter this like this and can read the text on them. Next, you just pop them into the chamber. There we go. And screw the cap in place. This cap should screw in very easily. If it puts up any resistance, back it out because you don't want to cross thread the cap. So it should just start screwing in really easily and then complete the whole process very easily just like that and you've changed the batteries. Now that we've got batteries in, the next thing we can do is make sure that the camera's ready to go to take photos and put some film in it. To load film, you just come over here to the back of the camera, lift up on the film rewind knob, and that's going to allow the back to pop open. I'm gonna grab a roll of 35 millimeter film. Any 35 millimeter film will work. And what happens is, if you look here, you can see there's some forks on the film rewind knob. Those connect with the inside of the film cassette. So just put your cassette in there, push the film rewind knob in and, and rotate it until it seats fully. Pull out a leader. The leader is going to connect to the take up spool over here. Feed it in, advance and advance. And now you're good to close the back. We're gonna set this down, take out the tension in the, in the film. We're going to now advance until the frame count window is at one. It should be at one right now. Yeah, it's close enough. So now we're at one. Next thing you wanna do is adjust your ISO. We put in 200 ISO films, so let's lift up on this ring and then you just rotate it until the white indicator there is next to your ISO. So now we're at 200. Films loaded, we're ready to go. So you'd go through your shoot, taking pictures, advancing your film, and you know your film is being advanced looking, looking here at the rewind knob. If it spins as you advance the film. And at the end of your roll, when you've finished all 24 or 36 exposures, you need to rewind it. So you push the film release button there, flip out the film rewind lever, and then start rewinding. And you're just gonna rewind and rewind and rewind and rewind until you've rewound the film into the cassette itself entirely once you finish. I'm going to, instead of doing that, I'm gonna show you what happens inside the camera when you take a picture. Now, film is one and done. So if you open up the film back when you have film in there, you're going to expose it and lose everything on there. Film can either record an image in a, in a controlled manner through the lens properly exposed, or in an uncontrolled manner like this. When you take a picture, your shutter activates and then you advance the film. And the film advances 
the distance of the shutter, which is 36 millimeters, plus an extra two to give you a little bit of space between the frames. Then, as you'll recall from the first video, this sprocket here doesn't allow the film to move backwards. So if you were to try to rewind the film now, you'd either break your camera or break the film. When you finish your roll and you push the film rewind button, now this spins freely and you can rewind the film. So you rewind your entire roll and you'll hear, a, you'll hear this sound through the camera. When you finish, uh, when your film pops off of the take up spool. And that's when you rewind and you would rewind the film all the way into the cassette. I'm gonna reuse this so I'm gonna leave a leader out. But you, you'd rewind the film all the way into the cassette grab your new cassette, pop it in, and keep shooting. Or if you're done shooting for the day, make sure to trip your shutter and set your camera aside and you're done until your next shoot. That's how you load film and unload film and I wanted you to see the process inside of the camera that's going on when you take pictures. But just remember, don't open the camera when you have film in it. Flash photography with the Nikon FG20 is pretty easy. It does not have a PC port, so your only option for using a flash is this hot shoe right here. So you'd mount a flash in the hot shoe. And with the FG20, if possible, you want to get an articulating flash. And an articulating flash is one where the flash part of it can move up and down and ideally rotate as well. The reason for that is because if you have a flash here, and your flash triggers and it shoots light up at your subject and then back down at your lens, your subjects are going to look very flat and waxy. It's not a flattering look for anyone. So having a flash on top of your camera pointed at your subjects is the worst place to do it. Since you have to have the flash on top of your camera, having one that articulates so it can bounce the light up at the ceiling, back down at your subjects, and then it bounces back at the lens is a much more flattering look. The reason for that is because we always see people and subjects with light coming down from above. Whether it is outside under the sun or indoors under overhead lights, the light from, that we see people in is almost always overhead. So that's a natural and flattering look for us. So with this camera, try to get an articulating flash. When you're using the camera to take flash photos, I said in the first video that 1 60th of a second is the flash sync speed. And what that means is that 1 60th of a second and anything slower, you can use for the flash. So a 60th down to one second and bulb. M90 uh, can, as I, as I understand it, is not suitable for flash use, but I know if I'm wrong on that, I'll be corrected. The reason for that is because of the way that shutter curtains work. Now, the shutter curtain on this camera travels up and down, but I can't do that with the way I sit here to film these videos. So when you take a picture, your first curtain opens and then the second curtain follows. And then when you advance the film, they reset. So when, when you're taking the photo at 1 60th of a second, the first curtain opens, the entire image plane is open to light for about a 60th of a second. And then the second curtain closes like that and then you advance. Well, if you set the camera to 1 quarter of a second, the first curtain opens and then the entire film plane is exposed to light for about a quarter of a second, and then the second curtain closes, and then you advance the frame. Okay, so what happens if you're at 1 500th of a second? Well, the first curtain opens, and then the second curtain follows behind it, like that. So if you use the flash at 1 500th of a second, it might trigger right here, let's say. Well, everything between my hands would be exposed and properly illuminated by the flash. Everything that's behind the shutter curtains would be black, having been had the light from the flash blocked. So you'd end up with a strip of exposed negative and everything else would be dark. So that's why when you use the flash, it has to be 1 60th of a second or slower. Any flash you could buy today that's a modern or an X flash they're called will work on this camera. Anyone that uses a standard hot shoe, that is. Any flash going back to the 70s or 80s, the old Vivitars and things like that will work just fine on this camera. The next thing we're gonna talk about is exposure compensation with the FG20, and that's this button right here. So what this does is this, when you hold it down, gives you two extra stops of light to your exposure. So let's talk about what that means in number terms. Let's say that you're at F5.6 on your lens, 
Aperture doesn't matter, but that's where we're at right now. And let's say that your camera is telling you a proper shutter speed is 1 1 25th of a second. If you hold this button down, it's gonna give you two extra stops of light or bump you up to 1 30th of a second. So this is going to overexpose your image by two stops. The reason that it, it, the camera has this is let's say that you're sitting in an outdoor cafe and you're under an awning and you're, you're in a, an area that is well shaded. But behind you is a very nice scenic view of the River Seine or some mountains or pick your place that you wanna be outside having lunch with someone. So the person sitting across from you with a very bright and well illuminated space behind them, you're both sitting in the shade. If you were to take a picture of the person in that setting, they would be very dark. The scene behind them would be properly exposed. So what you do is you frame up your person, you get your meter reading, and then you hold this button down and the camera will, if you're in automatic mode, automatically give you two more stops of light. Note one thing I, I, I started I was showing you how this works on the dial here, but exposure compensation only works in automatic mode. So I'll show you, I'll take a picture here. You should hear a longer exposure now. There you go. So basically in auto mode, what you would do is line up your frame, focus on your subject, hold down this button, and now the person who's in the shade will be properly exposed and the scene behind them will be somewhat blown out, but you should hopefully still be able to see where it is that you're sitting. So if you have your Nikon FG20, take a look through the viewfinder right now. And what you're gonna see is a large matte screen. It's the same one as the Nikon FE2 K2 screen with a ring in the center and then a central focusing prism. On the left side is a needle that tells you the shutter speed not that you're, you're set at. If you're in automatic mode, the needle will point to the shutter speed that you're going to take a picture at. If it's between two numbers, it's about halfway between those two numbers. If you're in manual mode, it will tell you what shutter speed you should be set at, but it won't give you uh, an indication of where you are. So what you need to do in manual mode to get a proper meter reading, and you know you're in manual mode because there's a red M in the upper left corner of that meter readout, is see, look through it, it says, okay, you need to have your shutter speed set to 1 2 50th. Then go to your shutter speed dial, make sure you're set there, and then go back, recompose, and take your picture. If you're in M90 mode, the meter turns off because um, there's no reason for it to be on. So if you're going to want to save some battery life on your camera, set it to M90. And other than that, what you have is a very nice wide open viewfinder that's relatively bright and, and uh, easy to use and very familiar to Nikon users. So now that we've talked about all of that, let's go through the camera and the process of taking a picture and see how to take a photo with the Nikon FG20. So you'll be standing behind your camera looking through the viewfinder. First thing we're gonna do is take a picture in automatic mode. What you wanna do is set it to auto and set your aperture. And when you set your aperture in automatic mode, the camera will pick the best shutter speed. It could be 1 363rd of a second and it will do it. The, the camera does not limit itself to what's on the manual speed dial. So you'll pick your aperture and if the camera can meet that shutter speed, it will. If you're using 800 ISO film and you set this to, one, to f1.8 in full daylight in automatic mode, you will not get pictures because the shutter speed of the maximum shutter speed of 1 1,000th is, uh, the, the fastest shutter speed is 1 1,000th of a second and that's too slow for 800 ISO film at f1.8. So as long as you give the, the camera parameters that are within its capabilities, it will automatically pick the best shutter speed. So f5.6, automatic mode, there you go. It has picked the best shutter speed and taken your picture for you. In manual mode, we saw how to meter. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna set your aperture to whatever you want it to be. Again, let's just leave it at f5.6. And then you look at your viewfinder and it says your shutter speed should be 1 15th. Okay, so you come back out to your shutter speed dial, set it to 1 15th, and you take your picture. 
there you go. And also always make sure when you take your picture that you're, you're focusing to make sure that what you want to have be in focus is in focus. So that's how you take a picture with your camera. What about a double exposure? Double exposures are pretty popular. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the science of how to do it and then the mechanics. When you take a, a single frame at f5.6 and 1 1 25th of a second that's properly exposed, the, the film receives an, enough light with that exposure to have a proper exposure. So if you did a double exposure at those settings, it would receive twice as much light and you would have a harder time scanning or printing your negative. You would definitely not get the results you want. So when you do a double exposure, you have to give the camera two frames that are each half as much light. So the first thing we're going to do is I prefer to control shutter time or exposure time for double exposures with shutter speed, not aperture. Aperture is very important for depth of field and creative control. So I prefer to pick a good aperture and then do the, the compensation with my shutter if possible. So let's say you're going to use f5.6 and 1 1 25th and that's a proper exposure. We need to have half as much light. If you do decide to control it with the aperture, that would mean going down to f8 and 1 1 25th. But if you're going to control it with a shutter dial, you need to go to 1 2 50th of a second. Even though the number is double, it's half as much time because we're talking about fractions. Half as much time is half as much light. So for your double exposure that is metered correctly at f5.6 and 1 1 25th of a second, you need to go to 1 2 50th. Then we're going to take our first picture. Before we advance, you want to hold down the film rewind button, pop out the film rewind lever, hold it, and then advance. And what that's going to do is rearm the shutter without advancing the film. Now you take your second frame, and now you advance. Now when you do this process, what's going to happen is that the gears take a moment to re-engage so that negative isn't going to instantly start advancing when you advance the frame like it would if you were just taking single exposures. So after your double exposure, you want to set your camera to f22 and 1 1,000th 1, of a second. And then you want to put your lens cap on and you want to take a dead frame and then advance it. The reason is that that dead frame protects you from having your double exposure frame advance only part way and then the next frame overlap it. And it's very disappointing to get a double exposure back and see that it's ruined because part of the frame has been overlapped by the next image. So the dead frame is mandatory with the FG20 and a good idea. Okay, so that's how you do a double exposure in manual mode. What about automatic mode? Well, let's switch to automatic mode. And so just in this case, you just set your aperture and the camera is going to pick, pick out the shutter speed, but it's going to give you the proper exposure. So you need to trick the camera into giving you the wrong exposure. You need to make it give you half as much light. We're going to do that here with the ISO dial. So we're using 200 ISO film today. Well, half as much light would mean you need to go one stop faster. 400 ISO film needs half as much light as 200 ISO film for the same exposure. So lift up your dial, turn this to 400, take your first picture, film rewind release button, film rewind knob, advance, take your second picture, advance. Now, if you're done with your double exposures, turn your ISO dial back to 200, otherwise all the rest of your film will turn out with being one stop underexposed. Lens cap, F22, 1 1,000th, dead frame. Go about your business doing whatever else it is you want to do with that roll of film. And that is it. That is everything that you can do with the Nikon FG20 just out of the box like this. It's a fun camera. It's got plenty of capabilities. It can do basically any kind of photography you want except super high speed photography. But 1 1,000th of a second is just fine for capturing any kind of sporting event. So if this video was helpful, please leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content 
which is useful to you. If you have questions or comments below, please leave those. I check my comments every day or two and I'm pretty good about responding. If you have suggestions or ideas for future videos, please by all means let me know. A lot of the content in these videos now comes from questions and suggestions you guys have made over the years. If you have uh, ideas or recommendations for future video reviews, let me know, of course. And one last thing, thank you everyone very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video series.